So again, we would uh, like to welcome you out to the first of our five Livestock Producer Education Series Nights. Uh, my name is Josh Dallin and I'm the Extension Faculty in Box Elder County. And I'm joined by my co-host, Jake Hadfield, who's the Extension Faculty in Cache County. And we're really happy to be hosting these events and hope that those of you joining us will be able to gain a bunch of knowledge from our specialists on campus. And speaking of our specialists, uh, we're very honored and, uh, to have Dr. Chad Page, our small ruminant specialist with Utah State University Extension, who is going to be uh, giving us our uh, educational component tonight. Uh, before we begin, I'm going to turn the time over to Jake just a minute for some housekeeping items, and then we'll turn the time over to Dr. Page and let him uh, take off with his presentation. Again, we thank everybody so much for being with, with us tonight, and we hope that uh, you're able to learn some things. Uh, one last thing is at the end of Dr. Page's presentation, we're going to allow for a question and answer session. Um, if possible, we'd like to use the chat so that we can keep things orderly. Um, if that's hard, if you're on a device that makes it harder for that, go ahead and unmute your microphone and, and go ahead and ask the question at that time and uh, we'll do our very best to, to get everything answered for you. It doesn't necessarily have to be questions about the subject matter. Uh, it can be anything that, that might be with small ruminants that you might wanna uh, ask Dr. Page about. So without further ado, we'll turn the time over to Jake and then turn the time over to Dr. Page. Thanks, Josh, I appreciate that. Like Josh introduced me, I'm Jake Hatfield from the Cache County office. Um, one thing that we just wanted to stress over this meeting is we're happy to provide it. We're happy that you guys are here. Um, but one of the things that we will have at the end of the meeting is a, a link that'll go to a Qualtrics survey. It'll literally take you a minute to fill it out, but please do fill it out because these evaluations, and I know you think extension events, evaluations, these evaluations help us to continue to provide these programs as well as continue to help us to improve them and know what topics we should be talking about and other things. So what I'm going to do is um, at certain times, I think I'm going to post it right now just in case, but then I'm going to post the same link later on at the end of the meeting. And please, before you leave the Zoom link, please fill out that Qualtrics survey so we can be able to get information back from you. So anyway, again, thanks for coming and I'll turn the time over to Chad. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Thanks, uh, Josh. I, it's an honor for me to be here at Utah State. I just recently started this job here and I've already got to know some really good uh, faculty and also some great sheep producers and some goat producers across the state. So I look forward to many years of service here and, and hope I can do well. Um, so I'm going to start off by first sharing um, my screen. Oh. Hold on just a sec. Okay, can everyone see the slide in large? Some head nods if you can. Thanks, Josh, for the thumbs up. Um, so <clears throat> today I'll be talking about a, a pretty difficult topic, okay? Uh, one that there's really not a ton of right answers to, but some tips and tricks that we can do to try to alleviate um, the pain that is caused by drought. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about those management and maybe even health concerns that we can think about during drought years. <clears throat> Starting off, I want to uh, bring us to a quote by Ben Franklin from the Poor Richard's Almanac in 1733. Uh, he said, when the well is dry, we learn the worth of water. This is a pretty powerful quote, and I think it speaks pretty true to our life in agriculture in the Western United States. Um, <clears throat> and especially times like now, 
when there's not as much snowfall or, or uh, precip as we have hoped for. So moving on, I thought it would be appropriate to just kind of introduce myself since I am pretty new to the state. Um, so I grew up in Chandler, Arizona, uh, kind of dairy country that was ultimately surrounded by urbanization and, and houses. But uh, here's a small picture of me as a, as a young kid um, with some of the sheep and goats that we had growing up. Um, I grew up and, and uh, always kind of had a little bit of interest in animals, but um, didn't know my path would lead me where it is. I did my bachelor's degree in Rexburg, Idaho, where I really became passionate about livestock agriculture and, and animal science, especially nutrition. Uh, just after my bachelor's, I moved to Bozeman, Montana, where I started working with a sheep scientist, the sheep extension specialist in Montana. And at the time, um, his name was uh, Dr. Witt Stewart, who is now just to the east of us in Wyoming, serving as the extension sheep specialist. <clears throat> there, we conducted a lot of different research projects that involved producers around the state, um, which I hope to aim to do here in the, in the soon, uh, in the future. So some of these looked at mineral deficiencies in ram lambs. Um, and we did a lot of feeding trial and kind of trying to address or quantify the different type of production losses that were being seen because of these deficiencies. Uh, right after that, <clears throat> um, I actually followed Dr. Stewart from Montana down to Wyoming when he was hired as the sheep specialist there and continued work um, with mineral supplementation and um, feeding trials based around zinc, uh, looking at ewe mastitis. So I've milked hundreds of range ewes by hand. And I uh, also spent some time at the sheep experiment station, um, the US sheep experiment station up in Du Bois, Idaho uh, with Brett Taylor and some other great scientists. So I've had a pretty good insight um, working uh, different places across the Intermountain West with both large and small producers. Um, much of the research I do is very applied and ultimately um, what my focus is is to help uh, put more money in our pocket as producers and ultimately increase uh, the efficacy of the sheep industry. So that's just a, a little bit about me. Um, but moving forward, looking at kind of the current outlook of the Utah sheep industry. Um, I just kind of wanted to put this in perspective before we start getting into management of drought, but uh, the vast majority of sheep in Utah are on operations that consist of more than a thousand head of sheep. Um, roughly 88 to or roughly 90% of all the sheep in the, in the state are ran on these large operations with maybe multiple bands of sheep. Um, however, roughly 99% of our producers um, in the state that have sheep have smaller flocks of sheep. Um, so as an extension agent trying to focus on, um, either do I focus on the higher percentage of sheep or the higher percentage of producers is sometimes a difficult one to think about, but ultimately aim to try to address everything, um, everything that uh, can, can help us all, okay? Another thing to think about is over the last uh, several years, the number of small farms have really increased across the state um, <clears throat> as far as being less than 10 acres in size, uh, roughly by 18%. Now, looking at drought um, and how it affects this industry in Utah, drought is really something that we are familiar with, okay? In ag, um, we are not foreign to drought. It occurs often, uh, more often than, than we would like. 
But here's just a list of multi-year droughts that happened through the 1900s. So <clears throat> there's a list of six of them here. Um, many of them over a duration of at least five to six years. Um, and this isn't even including the more recent droughts since after 2002. <clears throat> now, the reason I wanna say this is that because across the state of Utah, we're a very diverse state as far as climate, range type, forage type that our sheep are, are on and that we ultimately rely on to get sufficient nutrients for our animals. So you can see some of the bigger, um, here's, a, here's a ranking by the counties of the number of sheep. So San Pete County, um, as of 2017, has the highest number of sheep, um, followed closely by Box Elder and Iron County. Now, Box Elder, San Pete, and Iron are all on, you know, d vastly different areas of the state. Um, and forage types are, are slightly different across all of them. So thinking about drought in general, um, we're not gonna focus a ton on specific forage types um, or specific range types, but we're gonna talk about things that are universal across large and small sheep operations and then the diverse type of forages that we see. So, we know that drought, number one, affects the reduction in the total forage production that we have. That's really the number one thing that we're concerned about as producers. Um, and ultimately, we feel like we're kind of left with doing one of two options. So one option being, do we increase supplemental feeding and um, go with some of the downfalls that could accompany that? or do we decrease flock size to try to stretch out some of our feed sources longer? Um, and that could, um, that could really be decided based on a variety of factors as far as selling sheep or culling sheep uh, to save some of our feed sources. And some of them may, that we may want to ask ourselves is what is the current, um, cost of lamb right now? What is the future outlook of lamb? Um, how long will we have some of these different feed sources? How much of these feed sources do we have? And that could ultimately make or break some of the des decisions that you have. Also, another thing that drought does to our forage, and I'm not a rangeland specialist. Um, I do enjoy learning about plants, but forage quality does decrease in drought, okay? One research project by Skosta et al, that's a range scientist who dabbles in multi-species grazing over in Wyoming, uh, reported that as much of, as 3% of crude protein um, decreases in our native forages uh, for every one inch in reduction of monthly precipitation, okay? so. Thinking about that and maybe thinking about some of the other nutrients that we need, maybe minerals, trace minerals, um, different vitamins, the, or energy content in general. Uh, these are things to think about when we think about the reduction of nutrients on our forages that we have. So even if we can maybe cull some of our ewes out and have a smaller flock to increase the longevity of our feed source that we have, um, even if we did that forage and took care of that forage quantity uh, part of the equation, the forage quality still may be a detrimental factor um, to our management system. Drought also has negative effects on water. Number one, that we have less of it, okay? less of it to help grow the forages that we need and feed sources for our sheep. Um, but also it increases some of the dissolved solids or salinity of our water, which can really affect the water consumption of the animal. So as that water consumption decreases, 
Um, oftentimes feed intake decreases and then average daily gain is negatively affected and it takes longer to feed out animals um, or they become less feed efficient. So one of the things that we really need to know though is we need to know the water requirements of our animals, okay? We should know depending on a couple different factors, the stage of production of our ewes um, and our rams, the temperature and season, the feed type, and what is the dry matter content of that feed type? Are we feeding something, maybe a grain um, that's really high in dry matter content? Or are we feeding maybe a silage that's a higher dry matter content? Or maybe the pasture that they're on is a irrigated pasture that's pretty high in water content also. And then thinking about the intake of water, because all these things drastically affect the amount of water that your you will need um, during these times is the water quality, okay? So you can see here that depending on the animal and the stage of production, going from lambs all the way to ewes and peak lactation, really they can consume anywhere between two liters to 10 liters, up to 10 liters of water per day. So if you have a very high milk yielding ewe that needs to drink a lot of water, um, she's gonna demand <clears throat> that water in order for that lactation. So thinking about these things um, is important along with the feed portion and nutrients because decreasing the water intake will ultimately decrease your feed consumption, decrease your nutrient uh, consumption and may have negative effects. One thing, easy thing that we can do as producers uh, that doesn't cost us a lot of money, may cost us some time, is body condition scoring our animals, okay? How often are we getting out there and doing more than just looking at our animals, uh, but actually getting hands on them and really assessing how they're doing? Body condition scoring is a great way to assess the um, energy stores of the animal and really the well-being of the animal, okay? So here we have the basic diagram of how to do body condition scoring, feeling both over the ribs, ribs for a fat cover, but also across that spinal process. Um, if you guys can see my arrow here, um, across the spinal process in that lumbar area um, above the loin. So we're feeling for either a very spiny process, which is indicative of a lower body condition score, uh, like an emaciated you, or maybe thinner animal, all the way to something that feels very smooth, um, which is a higher body condition score indicating that they have a lot more back fat coverage, uh, that maybe you don't need to feed them as much if they're at a higher body condition score. <clears throat> another, another thing to know uh, with sheep is we're okay fluctuating in body condition score, okay? A you that's at maintenance, um, that has just been weaned off her lambs, um, she can be at a lower body condition score than a ewe that is at lambing um, or late gestation. Um, and here's kind of a, a basic diagram of some of that fluctuate, fluctuation we see. Now sheep are very seasonal breeders. Um, and if we wean off those lambs, we actually have a true time and maintenance that we can keep those ewes in maintenance prior to getting ready for the breeding season. Uh, the cattle industry, uh, generally, they're pretty interested in when that feeding that cow so she can breed back up, uh, oftentimes maybe while a calf is on her. Uh, in the sheep industry, we have the luxury of actually having a true maintenance period, and I think we should take advantage of it, especially uh, times like now during drought years. So one of the things that we can do to try to diminish the amount of groceries that we put into our animal is early, early weaning, okay? 
the early weaning can reduce feed costs and simplify management of both ewes and lambs. So ewes can be managed for maintenance. So instead of trying to feed them for that lactation, which is generally two, maybe three times higher as far as the amount of nutrients and energy that she needs, uh, we can manage her at a lower body condition score and we can feed her, feed her less ultimately. And then after that, once those lambs are weaned off, we can put more priority into their management, okay? Maybe we want to get them to a weight quicker and, um, and sell them, or maybe we're keeping back more replacement use, anticipating that the prices of lamb will go higher and that we can maybe sell replacement use to other producers who've culled out some of their flock due to drought. So successful weaning generally requires a couple things, okay? So lambs should be around six, maybe to eight weeks old, but there is the argument that it's better to wean off of weight. So if that lamb was born at 10 pounds, you want it, you know, two and a half to three times heavier than it was born. So we're looking at a 25 to 30 pound lamb uh, at weaning for this early weaning to work. And then you also want to make sure that some of these lambs when they're weaned early are pretty um, susceptible to coccidiosis. Um, so we want to make sure they have a coccidia stat in front of them. Um, also that they're up to date on some of their vaccinations for uh, overeating disease. So CD&T vaccination. So <clears throat> another thing to think about as far as weaning early is to make sure that you're thinking about the ewe. I think oftentimes we get caught up in thinking about how we're going to get that lamb off that ewe, but we need to make sure that as we're planning on weaning that lamb off, that we are slowly decreasing the quality of feed that that ewe is on, okay? Or maybe you can do that in the amount of feed that she's getting. So as we reduce that, she'll reduce milk production. And then as we wean those lambs, she's less susceptible to getting mastitis um, and that mammary infection that comes along with that. Uh, mastitis is one of the biggest contributors of us culling ewes here in the Western United States. And uh, by thinking about this, we can keep some of those ewes, have them have a more longevity within our flock. So talking about, I'm gonna focus on maybe just a couple uh, small diseases or uh, metabolic diseases to think about in drought years because of the decreased nutritional value of some of the feed uh, that we have either out on pasture or out on range um, is pregnancy toxemia, okay? Also known as twin lamb disease or ovine ketosis. And really what this is, it's an inadequate energy intake uh, during late gestation and this is generally in ewes carrying multiple lambs. This is pretty common is in goats also. Uh, species that carry uh, litter sizes, generally two or more. Um, and the way this works is here in this small diagram I put up, um, as those lambs grow in late gestation, because the vast majority, up to 70% of the growth of those fetuses will happen in the last third of gestation. So as these lambs grow in the uterus, that area will begin to push up against the rumen and it will decrease the capacity or volume of the rumen. So that you starts to become compromised and that she can't even eat enough of a hay to get enough energy out of it to uh, meet the energy needs in late gestation. So oftentimes this is why we give supplemental feed, a different energy source, maybe a, a grain or corn um, that works really well to keep our ewes from going into the state of ketosis during late gestation. But this is something to think about. Make sure your ewes are in proper body condition going in to late gestation and also keep an eye on them um, as as they're there. So some of, the, some of the symptoms may be that they reduce their time at the feed bunk. They aren't as aggressive as they once were. 
Uh, maybe they don't come up to the feed bunk at all. They lay down, go into recumbency, and ultimately will, will die pretty fast on you sometimes if you don't watch it. So the low glucose and high ketones in the urine or blood are um, present during this. And probably the best thing to do is take preventative measures. Adequate, make sure you get adequate nutrition of those ewes in late gestation. And this varies by breed type, right? So our 150 pound Rambouillet ewes um, that have singles are gonna, gonna require less as far as energy requirements um, or other nutritional requirements as maybe a 220 pound Suffolk ewe who's carrying twins at that time. Um, some of the treatments that we have are giving a propylene glycol orally um, or if it comes down to it, if it starts getting more serious, a dextrose uh, IV. But this could be something that you could talk to your veterinarian about if you have ewes uh, that are in this later stage of pregnancy toxemia. Um, I would really hope that none of us use, lose any ewes due to this. Another thing that's probably not as common, but I think was worth mentioning is the occurrence of urinary calculi, okay? Um, this is generally known as a calcium to phosphorus ratio, um, but urinary calculi or, or water belly, as we often call it, um, can also be increased. The susceptibility in our animals can be increased if they start drinking less water, if they don't have as much water consumption. So that contaminated water or that water with higher dissolved salt solutes that we see from drought situations uh, may decrease that enough in, in an area to uh, have our use or, or have our mainly our rams and weathers more susceptible to this disease. Um, it's actually most susceptible in weathers. South Dakota um, did some really great research back in the 60s, 50s and 60s, looking at urinary calculi and weathers and rams and they really show that weathers, even more so than rams, can be susceptible to this due to the fact that those hormones uh, that are produced by the testicles don't allow the enlarging of the urethral process um, where these, cal these buildups um, and stones occur and ultimately clog up the urethra. So <clears throat> diagnosis is, it's, you can see them uh, having difficulty uh, straining to urinate, uh, drizzling urine. They have a hunched up posture. Uh, they also uh, collect a kind of anemic or a, a buildup of fluid under their belly, hence why we call it water belly. And then really once the issue occurs, um, you don't wanna force the animal to drink more water thinking that'll flush it out because what could happen is that the bladder uh, would explode or break and ultimately kill the animal. Um, you would want to let that pass. Um, and surgeries generally aren't very effective in nature. Um, so the best thing to do is, is through prevention. So a calcium source such as a limestone um, in your pens with the animals is a, good, is a good way for them to get calcium and help prevent this. One more thing to, to think about. So we talked about some of the pregnancy toxemia um, during late gestation, which is at a very important time with our ewes. And probably the most important time during our production year is breeding season. Uh, when we let the rams out, we let the boys out to do their job. Um, but some of the additional stress caused by drought situations uh, with the water and nutrients from forages, may, this stress may cause um, decreased uh, quality in some of these breeding soundness exams on our rams. So making sure that you do an adequate breeding soundness exam prior to putting your bucks out is very important, I think, in these drought years. So <clears throat> what a BSE essentially is, is an assessment of that ram's potential to impregnate those ewes at one point in time, okay? A typical BSE consists of a physical evaluation 
Uh, secondly, a scrotal evaluation. And then lastly, a semen testing, uh, generally where you would have a veterinarian come out and do semen testing on your bucks. So <clears throat> another thing that you could do to maybe try to alleviate some of this stress um, that these rams could be feeling during this time is maybe consider increasing the ram to you ratio during breeding to reduce the burden on those rams. So if you're normally running, you know, 35 to 40 ewes per ram, maybe bring that back down to, you know, 25 ewes or, or less, depending on what you see fit. I know a common rule of thumb is 30 ewes per ram. Uh, so maybe a little less ewes per ram if you think that's something that <clears throat> the rams need. Um, another ask, so part of the physical evaluation is make sure that you, you check the eyes, check the teeth. Um, sometimes during drought years, if that forage is getting real low, um, there could be more sand consumption and, and things like that could, that could wear down on teeth. Uh, make sure you're doing the body condition scoring that we talked about to make sure um, they're in adequate energy stores. A lot of rams will lose a significant amount of weight, 15, uh, sometimes up to 20% of their body weight during the breeding season. And then make sure they're structurally sound. Um, they don't have bent legs or other issues that can allow them to get out and, uh, and move across the country or, or even pasture. Um, look at their body temperature is an easy thing to measure. Um, and any maybe contagious diseases that are not desirable. Sore mouth, pink eye, foot rot, et cetera. Um, examining the genitalia for abnormalities uh, kind of goes along with this, but it also goes along with uh, scrotal evaluation. So one thing that we want to do is look at, look at the scrotum of the animal, um, palpate the testes and feel, feel for any kind of lesions or, or lumps or maybe swelling. A common thing that we see is epididymitis where uh, the, epididym the epididymis will be uh, hardened either below or sometimes on the top of the testicle and it makes it appear as if one testicle is much larger than the other. Uh, however, that is not something that is desirable and would uh, keep the ram from passing a breeding soundness exam. Uh, measure the total circumference of the ram. Um, so here are what we consider the cutoffs for scrotal circumference within the sheep industry. Uh, ram lambs, we generally want to be um, above 30 centimeters, um, whereas our mature rams, we want them at least above 32 in order to pass this. Exceptional rams generally have either above 36 or 40 40 centimeters um, scrotal circumference, depending on the age of the ram. And then lastly, looking at semen testing, okay? So <clears throat> semen that you get collected probably with your veterinarian, uh, they'll look at a couple things, volume, color, any kind of signs of infection that you didn't see on a physical eval. And then more importantly, under the microscope, they'll really test for motility and morphology. And we have pretty high standards uh, for our rams and that we want, <clears throat> we want at least, uh, we generally, I have a typo here under motility, uh, but we generally want uh, a pretty high um, number of semen moving percentage wise. And also with morphology, we generally want over 50% of those to have normal uh, morphology and that they're swimming straight um, and that they don't have any kind of issues such as cytoplasmic droplets or, or bent tails or detached heads or some of those common things that we see. And if our rams were to fail one of these, um, we would want to give ourselves ample time to make sure that we could test them again. So if they passed the physical eval, if they passed the scrotal evaluation, and then maybe they didn't do quite as good in motility or morphology. This could be to the fact that maybe they had a fever um, a week or two ago, and that caused them um, to fail this portion of the test. But if we give ourselves anywhere from 30 to 60 days, we can test them again 
and oftentimes they'll pass this test. Um, generally, the big things that keep them from not uh, not passing are the the big physical attributes, but um, allowing us to test a second time for semen quality uh, sometimes is needed, especially in maybe younger animals or bucks that we're wanting to use. <clears throat> one, uh, one other thing, I kept thinking, well, you know, how, how can we save money during drought years? So if we decide to keep our flock size the same as it has been, um, what are some ways that we can save money? So we talked about weaning lambs early to try to save money um, in the amount of feed that we have to give our ewes. Um, but another thing I started thinking about is parasites. A recent study that was done, done um, across the Intermountain West, mainly in Montana and Wyoming, a producer here um, in Utah, I think Josh might have been involved in the study. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Josh. But it kind of looked at, uh, are you giving me a head nod or, or not on that? <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> one thing uh, that this study showed is that um, one of the, the worm burdens that we're most worried about is called homologous catortis or the barber pole worm. And these, uh, Worm populations were most abundant in irrigated pasture, rotational grazing uh, situations. And it seemed as if less, uh, less burdens as far as parasites, um, internal parasites are seen on range operations. And there is some research that shows, you know, the drastic change in temperature, the arid, uh, the arid environment is not ideal to letting some of these parasites um, grow to fruition or those eggs to be viable. And so one thing I thought is that if we test, if we take fecal samples and we test to see if we do have a parasite issue um, and we don't, say we don't, uh, maybe we can opt to not treat our animals. Say we have a large flock on range, uh, maybe not treating them for parasite issues that year could leave up some cash for us to use on additional um, feed that we need for our use and confinement. Another thing that we're starting to do more and more is if you are on those irrigated pastures, uh, FAMACHA scoring is a way to look at how anemic your animal is uh, as an indicator of how large their worm burden is. So if based on this little card here, kind of shows you what color the inside of the eyelid should be. Um, and if it's very anemic, then you treat the animal. And if it's not, uh, then, then you don't treat the animal. And not going into a lot of the details of, you know, resistance to these different drugs that we're using by these parasites, uh, this is a way that maybe we don't have to drench every single animal on our operation. Um, we can drench half of them and save save a little bit of money. Um, but one thing to think about, caveat to that, is uh, stress during drought might reduce some of that immunity to worm burdens. Okay, so even after I told you all that, uh, if your animals are nutritionally stressed, maybe their immunity uh, could be down a little bit. And something that in the past at uh, a really good nutrition level um, wouldn't bother them may bother them uh, this year. So uh, with that being said, some of these things to think about, uh, in summary, make a plan, make it specific to your operation and production goals, and know what you're going to do before it happens. Uh, it's always important to maybe have a cutoff. If you get to a certain amount of feed on pasture, you know you're going to cull some ewes, or, or maybe you need to go out and buy some extra feed. Um, Drought years, we know, decreases the nutrition quality of our native forages and decreases water availability, number one, and uh, also quality. So body condition scoring is a super easy tool, very inexpensive, that we can use to monitor that, monitor that animal's performance and uh, be okay with that you fluctuating in body condition score throughout the year. Um, and then pay a little bit extra attention to some of those common sheep health issues, 
especially during drought years that are associated with metabolic disorders like pregnancy toxemia. Um, and then think about management decisions. Maybe, maybe you need to switch your lambing season uh, so that you can get more forages off your pasture um, or that your peak production period is not during a time where you're hand feeding your ewes. Maybe you need to push your lambing back a little bit in order to match the natural uh, growth season a little bit better. So <clears throat> with these things said, I uh, thank you um, for listening to me and uh, I'll open it up for any questions. So Josh. Well, again, we'd like to thank Dr. Page for a great presentation and um, we would direct you, if you have any questions, go ahead and please type them into our chat box and we'll field those. Um, if you are on a device that uh, maybe you're joining us by phone, if you want to unmute yourself to ask a question, please do so. Um, we'll just wait a few minutes and let those questions come in. Also, while you're thinking of those questions, um, we're going to quickly turn the time over to Jake again to, to remind us of um, the survey and where it can be located. Okay, everyone, just letting you know, I put it in the chat for you. So if you look in the chat, there's a link there. You just click on that link and it should take you directly there. We made it so it's mobile friendly. So if you're on a phone, you can do it or on the computer as well. So go ahead and do that um, when you get a second. And yeah, thanks. We also want to remind everybody while you're filling out your survey, just a quick reminder that this will be a, an ongoing series uh, for the next couple of weeks. Um, next week, um, on the 4th of February at seven o'clock, we have Dr. Ryan Larson, who will be um, teaching us about ensuring against drought. Dr. Larson is our um, agricultural economics specialist and uh, he will provide a bunch of tools and resources to help understand what, what uh, we should and shouldn't do when it comes to uh, insurance. And um, I've had the opportunity to listen to Dr. Larson before in some of these insurance seminars and they're extremely helpful um, when it comes to, to your operations. So please uh, come and join us again uh, next week at seven o'clock. Hey, I'm not seeing any questions come in. If there's anybody that would like, to, oh, there we go. So Dr. Page, we have a question that says, what can you do to reduce fly blow in lambs in the summer on irrigated pasture? Okay. Um, okay, can you hear me? Okay, so it looks like uh, another thing came in from Kristen. It looks like he posted it again, or the first time he posted it uh, to me. But so uh, reducing fly blow in lambs in, in summer in irrigated pasture, is that, is that a pretty big issue here? And uh, Mark, I mean, what, what area are you in? I feel like to answer so, some questions, you gotta ask a lot of questions first, so. Uh I'm down in the southern part of the state, down in Beaver, and we have a lot of problems in, in, in the wet pastures with the lambs getting the poop out, out there on their wool and the flies coming in, and, and we've lost some lambs from some of the producers on the irrigated pastures. Okay. <clears throat> so just really high moisture content pastures is where we're seeing this at. Um, that... I'll, mm -hmm. I'll have to look into that one a little bit. Maybe you could type in your contact and I can uh, get a hold of you privately and, or, or let Josh know. Um, but that's something that I haven't dealt with a lot yet. Um, and even up in Montana, but you're getting a little bit closer to where I grew up in Arizona. And so I could see that the, uh, the warmer climate could play a factor in that. Chad, um, I've got Mark's information. I'll make sure to get that to you after the meeting. Okay. Are you, is Mark down in 
is it Iron County or, or what area Beaver. is it? Beaver. Okay. Um, and then it's the other Iron County. Is it? Hey, Mark. Um, Mark, this is Jake Benson here on Kristen's computer. Hi. And 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 what I've what I've noticed with the fly blow is when it's stagnant water, it's not a clean water source. With my situation um, on Cedar Mountain is when we have fly blows when you have stagnant water conditions. Hmm. And, and we didn't have as big a problem with this last summer when things were so dry. So that might, might make a difference too. <clears throat> hey, so Chad, it looks like our next question actually came from Jake that just joined. He said, vaccinating using lambs for parasites. It says Normectin Plus and Ivamec Plus. Then asks if um, anyone's ever used long range that's labeled for cattle. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone's used it for sheep and, and what your recommendations there would be. Um, I, I guess that is a question opened up for anyone, if anyone's used long range. I mean, I've heard of some of these <clears throat> for vaccinating for parasites that has worked pretty well for people. Um, but as far as long range, I'm not quite familiar with. So has anyone else used it or? Um, I haven't particularly used long range, but one of the things that, um, you know, having sheep my whole life and, and then learning that FAMACHA training and getting more into the parasite education, one of the things that I found that was really interesting is even in, even in undergraduate and graduate courses, they were teaching us for a long time that every year you should switch out your different uh, dewormers. So you should do an ivermectin and then maybe do a valvesin and do all these different things throughout, you know, every 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 other year, so that you're switching them out, so that the so that the parasites didn't build a resistance to that dewormer. And what I found was really interesting is the new science that's being brought out is saying that actually doing that is worse than yeah. and using an ivermectin, for example, until you find either through the fecal float samples or through the famacha uh, the famacha testing. That it's not working, and so I thought that was that was just a really interesting thing. And Dr. Page, I know you were in on a lot of those studies, and so I'll not go too far into that. But that was just really interesting to me, specifically for our sheep producing group here, to note that that everything that we always learned when it came to that new science is saying different. Yeah, I, yeah, that is what they're saying now. So. You know, instead of really rotating through, we should just use one and until it stops working on our operation, and then and then switch to another one. But through that Famancha uh, scoring um, training, we learn to keep a certain number of those bugs or parasites that never truly become resistant to to our dewormer, which is ultimately what we want. So it keeps working, especially in the sheep industry where we have very few dewormers to work with so well my question is because long range is utilized as a it extended release and it's mm -hmm. injectable yeah so with my operation is i do a pour on right after shearing and then mid-summer i do an injectable with the ewes and the lambs and then in the fall after the lambs are weaned, when we do fall tagging, I inject the ewes again because I have a major problem with liver flukes in the summertime. And this is irrigated pasture at 7,000 feet elevation. And so that's why I'm wondering if the long range would be better than Ivomet Plus, which targets liver flukes, say the end of July. And since I've started really aggressively vaccinating for the wormers. Um, my wean weights have come up, but I'm just wondering about the long range injectable because I've been using Ivomec Plus and Normectin Plus 
because those are the only ones that go for liver flukes in the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to say, especially, you know, as a USU employee, I don't know if I can, uh, really, you know, say use something off label. Um, but yeah, because Ivomec yeah. Plus and Normectin Plus are not labeled for sheep, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why I'm wondering about the long range. It's a little more expensive and it's oil based. So I'm thinking that it would be very effective or it's an extended release type of vaccination for worms. And these liver fluke issues are mainly with standing water or around standing water? Um, Took a couple old ewes in that were getting thin and just couldn't figure it out. Took them to the vet. The vet said you have a liver fluke problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't I can't speak to long range. I think we'd have to talk to a probably a veterinarian about that. But I and anecdotally, I I've heard lots of people say, "Oh well, you know, I got ducks on pasture or, or geese, and they take care of those carriers of the liver, liver flukes." eat up slugs, snails, stuff like that, that could be a way to try to reduce the amount of liver, liver flukes without uh, talking to the, the dewormer or the injectable. Um, but <clears throat> I, think, uh, I, I think what you're doing as far as treating your animals is uh, correct in the right direction, so. So my next question here, um, getting the fecal samples that you guys are suggesting, I, I would be more than happy to do several fecal samples and send with you guys. I just don't know the direction or who to send them to. Right. No, I can, um, I can get you Mark, that. Mark or Randall could give me the info because I work with both of them directly all the time. Okay. And I'd be, I'd be really happy to try to figure this out because I'm not the only one that has the same issue in this area. Yeah. And, and, and I'm one, in, I'm in Iron County. And one thing that I would suggest is probably take a pooled sample. So don't collect and send off individual uh, samples unless you want to. But uh, Josh, I mean, tell me what you think with a lot of this uh, parasite research we've been doing, we would take uh, a bunch of samples and combine them into one sample, uh, for the veterinarians to look at, and then they could give us kind of a diagnosis of what type of parasites we're, we're looking at, so. It, ideally, if you can get eight to 10% of your, of your flock, if you're gonna do one, um, it makes sense and just do it at random. And, and what we tried to do, we did it as part of, uh, as part of a presentation and as part of a, a workshop. And we tried to get some of the age Jews, some of the younger, uh, not quite mature type e lambs, and we did we did a pool that way, and it was really telling. It was really interesting to see the results from that, and and not only that, but once you have that fecal float done, you you can have that that veterinarian's recommendation of exactly what might work best to treat for what your problem may be, and you may also find out that you don't have as big of a problem as what you're thinking it might not be a parasitic issue. A lot of times when we have body condition scores that, that go low, we automatically think, oh, well, it's worms. Uh, but sometimes it, it's, it's something else. It's some sort of a deficiency somewhere else. And so that, that um, fecal float is a really, really good tool to be able to help to identify scientifically what we're dealing with. And so I, I, I would say that's a, that's a good direction to go with just to, to be able to identify those types of things. And then your veterinarian um, is the one that can recommend most about what types of those medications that you would maybe use for those, those issues. And if it was, for example, a, a liver fluke issue, they would say, well, we're gonna, because we have this relationship, even though it's not labeled for sheep, we recommend that you use this, this type of, uh, of dewormer. Um, I will say one of the things that I found interesting when it comes to dewormers, we had our, our local veterinarian here that did a study with his kids for a big FFA project that went on to win a bunch of different awards. And they found that the valvazin 
um, the oral drenched valvazin was actually the most effective and they did fecal floats. They did regular fecal floats where he was a veterinarian. They were able to, to do testing and sample sizes and they used different uh, dewormers across the board. And it was really interesting to note that. The only problem with the valvazin is it is one of the only dewormers that you cannot use during gestation because it can have fetal harm. You have to be careful with that if your user are pregnant, but um, I, I just found that really interesting um, that that was the case for, for the valvazin. Yeah. So the valvazin, what about during lactation? Dr. Page, I, I'll defer to you on that, but if I'm not mistaken, it's completely just during the gestation. I don't think there's anything wrong with, the, with lactation right after they lamb. It, it's just something about that fetal development that, that they warn against. Yeah, I'd, I'd need to look that one up. Um, I mean, I, I know it's one of the most common used. I mean, even in that study with all the surveys we did, uh, Valvazin is the most common used ag across the Intermountain West um, and, and still does pretty well. We haven't built up a lot of resistance similar to the Southeast. Um, but an another thing I wanted to say real quick, Mark, or, or Jake, I apologize. Um, is that an easy way to tell whatever you're using works is that you do a fecal egg count prior to treating. And then after you treat, you wait, uh, I think rule of thumb is around two weeks, and then you, you do a fecal egg count again. And then that way you can get an idea of if that dewormer is working on your operation um, or, or not. And then you know maybe you have two different dewormers and you, you take fecal egg samples on a number of use prior, you treat half the use with one, you treat half the use with another type, and then you can do fecal egg count again and see which one was more effective. So, and that's a, a fairly when you cheap- do, when, you, when you go do your fecal egg count, how do you separate between one vaccination and the other if you're running a range operation? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, how, I mean, because you're not going to split the herd for this right. little experiment, right? No, it it would just it would be through rep record keeping. I mean, this is a lot easier to do with a smaller flock. Maybe you have a a smaller purebred flock that you go through jugs instead of range lambing. Um, but I mean, that is a fairly cheap way to do it if you have the means to do it that way. But you could just start off with doing the one and not separating them at all, just to see the efficacy of it. All right. Well, Randall and myself will work towards this this summer to help the rest of the producers in this area. And the next question I have is the safeguard deworming block for sheep. It's not labeled for sheep. What's your knowledge of that? I, I haven't, I'm not familiar with it. Josh, are you? That one I'm not. Um, all the other stuff I, I, I've heard of, but I haven't heard of the, of the block. Um, so it looks like I have some homework to do for you, uh, Jake. All right, because the, the safeguard dewormer block um, seems pretty convenient in certain situations. And I know other producers that are concerned and like to use it. And so we want to know what your guys' professional opinion with your research would be. Well, I, I think with any free choice or, or you know, a block or, or some other free choice, um, even supplements like mineral, there's just so much variation in consumption. So you're, it's hard to tell whether or not uh, they're hitting that target intake or um, they're not touching it or they're consuming twice the amount that they need to. Um, so although it is convenient, I, I think in my opinion, just looking at ad libitum kind of free access uh, stuff, it just, it's hard to monitor intake and ultimately you could still leave a lot of animals with parasite burdens. 
Okay. Um, what about mixing diatomaceous earth with your salt, loose salt? I So I think a lot of the research on diatomaceous earth um, hasn't shown a lot of efficacy. I don't, I don't think as far as I've read, it isn't, uh, it doesn't work as well as I think we've made it out to be uh, talking am amongst ourselves. Um, but with that being said, there are some people who, who swear by it, but none of the research uh, truly backs that up. Okay. Good question though. I, I used to work at Home Depot um, we had a lot of people come in and buy diatomaceous earth for horses and, and other livestock. So it's a feel good, makes them feel good about themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Those are good questions. Boy, Dr. Page, I'm, I'm happy that you got to fill most of them. Those are good, good ones, Jake. <laughs> Do we have any other questions that maybe anyone in the group has we're watching the chat here and we're coming up on just a, uh, just a hair over an hour. Uh, so if you have any pressing questions you'd like to get in, let's get them in now. And please, again, as uh, Jake Hadfield mentioned, uh, please take the time to go ahead and fill out that survey for us um, so we can get your, your feedback and information. Hey, it looks like maybe our questions have subsided. We'll hang on for just a little bit. I am going to go ahead and stop the recording here. Um, and we'll hang on just a little bit so that you can access that uh, uh, chat box that's going to have that um, survey link in it. And again, we appreciate everybody for joining us tonight. Especially would like to thank Dr. Chad Page, our small ruminant specialist for USU Extension for his presentation and building of questions. We hope to see everybody next week as we welcome Dr. Ryan Larson for the ensuring against drought portion of our series. Thanks again, everyone, and look forward to seeing you again.